the redwood forests are dying. They say that five or six years from now, the floating smog from Los Angeles will have killed hundreds of thousands of trees. A few of the trees have been put under plastic tents so that people will know in time to come what kinds of trees grew there. Meanwhile, the chemicals are still being poured onto the fields and the colossal industrial wastes dumped or oozing into the rivers are being flushed into the sea, eaten by the plankton, eaten in turn by the fishes, the birds, the mammals. I saw a colony of seals on a television program made in America in which the mother seals were throwing their pups against the rocks to kill them. These seals had a count of DDT in the blood several hundred percent higher than what could be tolerated. They were mad. The name of the program, so far seen only in England, unfortunately, was cancelled owing to lack of interest. I saw an island of rare gannets, about 500 pairs, I think. Last year, only two eggs hatched. A chemical with the abbreviated name of PCB or something like that is now leaching into the ocean from sources difficult to detect and makes the eggshells too brittle to sit upon. But there's something more disturbing. Growths are beginning to take place in the sea. They call them diatoms. These diatoms are lethal they float for miles, killing everything in their path. The danger is, says one of the great experts in America, that in the next five or six years, these diatoms may begin to go at geometric progression. If this happens, he says, all marine life in the oceans will be over by 1980. Well, one can only hope he's exaggerating. But don't forget, it only took 25 years for man to obliterate the immemorial balance that had lasted for millennia between the plant life, the sod, and the various grasses in the northwestern prairies of America. It only took 25 years to turn them into a dust bowl. Thousands of people fled to California, those parts remain a dust bowl. The other program I saw on television was called Echo Catastrophe. I saw it the same day. In it, two newscasters are casting the news in 1980 to review the events that have brought the world to a state of giant famine and the verge of a nuclear holocaust. I was shattered. What can anyone do? What can a poet do? It's not enough to write something. Perhaps I could write something that could be recorded, televised, reach a maximum public. The poet's job is not so much to give information, which is flooding in anyway, as to give people feeling. I wanted to hit, shock, wound people into an awareness that would impel them to go out and do whatever they can do. Well, what else is there to say? Just this, I think, very quickly. The poem evolved as a series of uh, musical movements. Sometimes I didn't really know what I was writing. I only knew that I had to have a certain kind of music. For instance, the part, there's a part that begins, and you'll recognize it, which goes, so take your little boy, and da 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 I wanted something inconsequential, trivial, doggerel, and yet hurt and cutting to express the sarcasm I feel at the way we think we can chop, alter, manipulate everything with a callous stupidity of vested interest that makes a mere dummy of the sentient, the whole sentient being. These things uh, will come across to you emotionally, I think, long before, uh, or at least beyond the point at which uh, you understand my word. One last thing. I had just um, finished translating the Alcestis of Euripides, 
written in the 5th century BC. It's a play in which a young married couple face this situation. The husband, Admetus, has begged death to, death to let him off dying. And death finally says, yes, so long as I'm not cheated of a body, someone will have to die for you. Well, the only one who will is his own wife, Alcestis, and she dies. The play opens with her dying. And then, of course, Admetus realizes that he might as well have died himself because life is now intolerable. And I suddenly realized this was a perfect image of what we are doing to the world. We think we can go without beauty, take it or leave it. We can't. Beauty is simply the external expression of a right balance and harmony. The poem has three titles. You can take your choice. Ad nauseam or death at fun city or future shock. Incidentally, when I wrote the poem, I didn't know that fun city was a nickname for New York. When fire burns, air dies. Greed is the property of fire. Someone has put a car into the drawing room. Someone has swept the moon under the carpet. Someone has fed the baby chlorinated hydrocarbon. Pollution is under the floorboards of our feast. Women's lib has done away with marriage. Admetus is allowing Alcestis to expire. Her coffin's in the garage. Who has put cushions on my eyes? Stuffing my two eyes with the softest dung. Who has let a river of sewage sluice through my ears? Who has kidnapped my children with a copywriter's song? Who has turned them into fodder for the great moor? Used them to sell liquid soap instead of hope? And got them drunk on an advert's usque bore? Woe to you who have cut down the trees, saying, Come, let us make an extra ten cents. Woe to you who have said, When we have seen one, we have seen them all. The people have been had. Admetus is letting Alcestis die and does not realize he will go mad. The forest trees are dying leaf by leaf. Woe to the lives that will linger on, the seconds crooked within the minute, minutes within the hour, hours within the day, crippled days tottering into each other, making unremembered weeks, weeks within the month. Woe to the ragged heaps that are called a year. We are all flunkies, our souls sandwiched between the fool and the slave, daydreaming, dullness and servility, peppered with cupidity, Shovel our egos on top of the compost grave. The light that lightens every man is hid behind the smog. I hope it filters to the soul at last, before the lungs clog. Alcestis is the list of water, air, and sun, and all those pigments of the heart that cannot be assessed. Will our lute consciousness rising from the slime rise in time the surgeons all bizarre obtuse and militantly sure as one might have guessed have but a single cure cut off her breasts mysterious blooms of diatom loaded with death float their cargoes through the dark towards a putrescent shore a scatology of monster cats haunt the jungle, strutting through the high-rise flimsy flats, listening to every whispered hiss, every smothered wish, every cardboard cry between the slats. Oh, to be known, to be loved, to be able to, to be. Understand how much it suffers, this inanimate city, its heart locked in a steel frame, a net of iron. We are all waiting for this wounded, intrinsically wounded, wounded building 
to collapse. Or go up in smoke, perhaps. We are waiting for the ashes. They at least will be pure, reduced to the original salt. After the ashes have cooled, new trees will grow. And from these last phosphates, a new edifice will rise after the war of the monsters, after the spawned mutations have rotted along the shore. Meanwhile, Alcestis dies, and her husband does not realize Alcestis is the list of things we cannot analyze. Where has my love gone to in the small hours? I have woken suddenly and cried, Where is he? Where is my God? I must get out into the open faith and give. I must breathe fresh faith or otherwise tear off my clothes and smash the windows, pick up the rickety chairs and bring them down like matchwood thunder. I must make a tinkling cascade of cheap china. I must, I must, I must, if I be denied love. I must hurt the trees, slaughter the last whales, butcher polar bears from a chopper, slow to a stop photogenesis in the seas. If I be denied love, let me spit, let me shit, let me fart, copulate with the great industrial military mother, the political petrochemical succubus and the labor union harlot. Let me copulate in public if I be denied love. I must groom the shark-nosed bombs in gunmetal stables. I must anesthetize the seas with nerve gas and EDTs. The gross national product must grow, though we shrink our world into fables. Usura acerbates as lack of love contaminates. Let me pack my bags for international jamborees, sit at banquets with platefuls of pleas, while under the table I rub knees with pig-eyed thieves, if I be denied love. If I be denied love, I am a rat with a brain, a hog with blue eyes, a snake with a pseudonym, a virus with a victim. If I be denied love, I am a poisoned river, a dried up lake, a bunged up cunt, a petrified phallus, a lonely runt. If I be denied love, I am the wonder loaf, the farinaceous crime, made of bleached sawdust and pish which when it hits the gravy turns into slime. I am the great actor's chocolate voice, selling detergents to kill fish. If I be denied love, I am the sterilized gaze of the children, held in the leprous lapping of the silver screen. I am the light that lightens their eyes to crime, transmogrifying their rows of hearts, into rows of chewing kine. I am the spade radio meddling with non-being, plugged to a count of heads in the greatest common bovine. I am the berserk seals in their hideous spree, thwacking their pups into dead dolls by an oily sea. I am the mephitic slicks smearing sea shells, creeping up on the last turtles in the Seychelles. If I be denied love, let me go, let me go, let me go back, let me go back into the womb, let me go back into the brew of antique, of antique blood, the primordial fermentation. Let me go back and stop me, stop me at the fish. No, stop me at the bird. For on Cock Robin Island, the gannets have paralysis. Admetus lets his wife die because there is no way to assess her through cost-benefit analysis. Someone has swept the woods under the concrete. Will skirts be up or down next spring? 
几楼沙。But what we know is this: the wayside will be marvelous with bottles, paper, plastic cups, and everything. And what of the ecumenic city, Cosmopolis? In a hundred springs, there'll be ten billion of us. Is it to be Cacotopia, and then Necropolis? It isn't that we'll die, but that we'll linger. Yesterday Troy burned. Today Icarus plunged into the sea. Disaster there is always, but tomorrow a universal conjury of wounded buildings will bruise, bring down, and batter Homo sapiens. Dreams without reason are not enough, and reason without dreams is not enough. Only dreams and reason will save us. The dreamer and the scientist must be one. In every computer, a poet must be locked, and we must have computers in the clouds. Out of dreams are shaped realities. Behold, the dreamer cometh. Let us kill him. I am the bruised flute of a November evening. I am a giver of degrees. I give tickets to the dunces to spread the disease. I am Bubus Americanus, Bubus Mundialis. I have spent ten years on a barbarous, massive classification of the obvious. The rose inside my head is, of course, quite dead. I think I only know what I can prove. I do not know that I can prove, only what I know. I cannot breathe, but I'd rather not retrieve the only life I have. I'd sooner pay for affluence with effluence. I am the lost prairies of the West, turned by the new stupid into dust. The gannets on Cock Robin Island, their brittle eggs are broken. Battery rear, de-headed chicken, are running in the open. One, two, buckle my shoe. Three, four, make war. Five, six, oil derricks. Seven, eight, defoliate. Nine, ten, take up Zen. These are things a child of six can tell me. Who killed Cock Robin? I said the sparrow with my little arrow. Who killed the railways? I said Lord Duff. I'm too clever by half. Who stopped production? I said the taxman with my little axeman. Who cut up England? I said Lord Haulage, for the sake of the mileage. All the nations of the earth fell a sighing and a sobbing when they heard of the death of poor Cock Robin. The larger the city, the greater the distance. The faster the transport, the slower the traffic. The quicker the jet plane, the louder the noise. The richer the suburb, the thicker the refuse. The higher the tower, the greater the drop. The road to disaster gets faster and faster. Stop! Cut through the lungs for the sake of the bowels. Cut through the heart for the sake of the liver. Cut through the brain for the sake of the head. Cut through the tongue for the sake of the vowels. Cut through the woods for the sake of the river. Cut, 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 cut to deliver bad bread. So take your little boy and make his penis longer, bind his mouth with corduroy and make his teeth much stronger, chop his little fingers off but leave his little toes, bung his ears with food stuff but leave his nose, give him someone else's heart but expect him still to play, the same gay part, and dance in May. Alas, alas, alas! When fire burns, air dies. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. We look long at our own mirror-looking faces, but the soul is hinged on something wider than the sea, which streams from our eyes. And they, like moons, draw an ebb and flow of all existence through our window. We touch eternity at every second decade, instead of every second of the day. 
traveling continuously over the thoughts and wrinkles of our lives, walking through ourselves and waiting, walking down those crowded avenues where nobody appears. And I am haunted by the torsos of the gods as I sit among the bungle and obesity of human flesh, knowing the sweat and putrefaction, unable to forget the churning factories of the Vishara. Yes, there is a septic flood. The disheveled devil of our own despair sits and rummages in the sewers. The sluice god opens the sluice cock to our dirty blood. Therefore, when I turn a face to face the face that I shall meet, Dionysus rises in me with a vicious beauty, whirling his thyrsus clad in his panther skin, and sometimes smiling, and sometimes with a shout he leads the dance. He turns our own menads on us and smiles when they tear us from our proven follies. Look how the lordly bull with its intransigent stare is down flensed to a carcass by the swarming hands of girls. We have refused to bow before the divine, and the night hangs in solution in its own dark. Layer on layer we tread the ash-thick past, knowing we can only breathe the dead, stepping on the overthrown and all that is gone. I feel in me the congestion of a mile of cars, and suddenly a faint sickness for the divine. I see the cars as halted hearses in a line from Washington to Peking. The caskets are arranged like sentences, awaiting to be spoken death by famine. So, be beginning, be beginning to despair. Despair, 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 despair. Hush there. The lares and panates everywhere shall rise and hold our hands and we shall learn to kiss the glass of clear water, the crooked picture on the wall, the apple with a weevil at its core and the running saw. Everything is given and everything is refused or taken. There is nothing that is not given. There is nothing that is not chosen. Sloth, the terrible indolence of the disillusioned that leaks through our souls, must pass away till our new devotion learns to save, conserve, adore. Every filament and particle must be a vessel in which we find divinity and store humanity. For there is an angel still under every star and quasar. There will be new festivals and a new leisure. There was a time when I could share my whole heart with a teddy bear who did not fight me for the light. Childhood, death and love are the deepest pools. Not duration, but intensity. We feed on a transitory food, the moments as they pass, turning them into our soul, which will ever last. Caterpillars of the divine, munching at the visible, passing it through us, and leaving the dross behind, until one day the invisible will shine. Every pole and galaxy is plunging like a stone into the sea, and the transient everywhere is plunging into a profound being and permanent birth as our destiny soars. And we cast back at the Creator his effulgence, though dimmed by our breath. In this structure of wonder, is there time, still time, to repudiate the ugly cup with the broken handle, the meaningless inscriptions on its rim, The death that is coming is a grace for life through death defines its purpose. And those that depart will depart 
into deeper reality, and those that remain will no longer be angels without a God and without a message. Time, still time, to change the picture on the screen till countervailing visions angelically mirror back a garden in high noon, and we can, for a moment, see pure swathes of green and undiscovered orchards between the burnt-out prairies, and hear the nightingale slake his song in the still of the afternoon. I've always felt that to sit in the sun and give thanks to God for his glory was just about the best thing, and now I wish I had played with the babies more and just left things. I've only two regrets, never having prayed enough, never having loved enough. A woman said that who had been told by her doctors that she had only months to live. And now I wish I had played with the babies more. I've only two regrets, never having prayed enough, never having loved enough. I remember once when my son was three and my small family was living in Mexico, opening the door of his bedroom one very moonlight night and being struck into an almost pathetic awareness of the vulnerability of man's fate as the moon lanced into the room and lit up that little kernel of loneliness, lying deserted, soul curled up and cloistered, deep within the fallen ark, small unbruised mouth of earth's flower ajar, millstone lunar face and cyclops eye of light, door on the sudden dark, sand of his hair, enlightened sad small corner, in the desert night, lashes of the spirit long before the drought and lean days mark, poor shrunken stone discarded, cowering in the grass, the tender soul, the slender, where the stream has passed and the laughing all gone under in the dark. Marmorial eyes and shadows behind where he has wandered, chasing far his dragonfly, where the sunbeams of his seeing fly and smart. Future of the cosmos, quiet, coiled and breathing, selfhood hoods him over. I bow before his smiling and weep his part. Ripples of his person pulse in wonder, out and out and loving, universe and window out to meet the moon and see the seasons start. Even as I watch him, small knotted lamb of God, make seas behind his eyelids and move the stars. There is no priest without a victim. There is no chart. O oh, bravely bubbling, doomed immortal, breaking atoms with a laugh, I see you through a wound ajar, shaft of the slit moon slanting, tilting, tilting, straight at your heart. Of course, when you hear a poem for the first time, it goes too quickly for the ear. You feel you'd like to stop it and linger, capture a phrase as it passes, and that can't be done. It doesn't really matter. Poetry dredges up life from a level way below the purely conscious. And if a poem is working for you, it is enough, at, at first hearing anyway, it is enough that some sort of stirring begins within you. The value of rhythm and tone and the hundred and one devices of poetry is that they lull the conscious mind and open the psyche to a deeper kind of truth, being itself. One of the objects of poetry is to recreate being, but more intensely. 
I once ranged around me a series of objects. There was a Coke bottle, a brick, a um, hairbrush, a teaspoon, and so on. And I thought that if I riveted them with a kind of passionate regard, I could extract from them their inner nature. And I'll read you just one, the Coke bottle. Incidentally, I was tackled by a lady after a reading once, and she said, why did I waste my time writing poems about Coke bottles? And I think she wanted me to write a poem on Vietnam. And my answer was not, but I think it should have been, Madam, all my poetry is about Vietnam. All my poetry is about the human condition. Well, the Coke bottle empty. Vertically glaucous with greenish lines, trapping the light, a magpie of hues, it stands neither squat nor tall, with its hard, vitreous rind, nozzling upwards the O of its empty mouth, and you let it with a high double collar. It will clink against its kind, but elsewhere voices only a dull chime. Its round torso bulges, a tailor's dummy, gathering inwards its tumescence to a low, restricted waist. And at its feet, a stagnant film of old elixir lies, deserted at the green base in an eyeglass puddle of umber. Across the swelling bodice of its middle, a stenciled flourish reads Coca-Cola. And above the circling pinafore of its moulded midriffs, a stamped excrescence of tiny letters makes points of shining. Around the firm girth of its shoulders, a barely perceptible tassel of glass hangs in five faint medallions, tapering into the short neck. Heaviness and strength are its attributes, and a smoothness of throat. Even here, in its nugatory and neglected stance, it sends out a jellied touch into the cellar light, a cold, stony impetus towards coolness. And it outlives forever the ephemeral and amber flurry of its winking foam, the million-eyed beady run of its tingling passage. I want to read you a letter I once wrote to my wife when we were in different countries. She was in Mexico and I was in England and I received a letter from her full of despair. What was the good, she said, of bringing children into a world such as ours, so riven with threats and strifes, not to mention the atomic bomb? And I didn't know how to answer her. But I found myself writing this letter to a young mother. Now, the curious thing about this very simple poem is that it means the opposite of what it seems to be saying. It seems to be saying, you can't do anything. You can't alter the terribleness of life. But really it is saying, you can do something much more important. You can do the only thing that matters. Letter to a young mother. Darling, let the children grow, and do not falter. There's little you can do, and nothing alter. If you will only steep them in your quiet loving, and let their angels play along their living, there is a seed inside that you can nurture, stronger than your hope, as strong as nature. So, darling, let the children grow, and do not falter. There's little you can do, and nothing alter. No bomb exists, can blast away their choosing, nor way to substitute yourself for losing. You cannot save them from the test they are made for, but hug them to your heart, and heaven prayed for. So, darling, let the children grow, and do not falter, there's little you can do, and nothing alter. Everything is theirs, and theirs the reaping of years, both gold and years, gone one in weeping. 
The light that lightens every man will lighten the way they go, and there no monster frighten. So, darling, let the children grow, and do not falter. There's little you can do, and nothing alter. Poetry is the verbal record of intense perception. And if poets have any value, which I firmly believe they do, then it is to help people apprehend their being more deeply, more vividly, and to love it. The scene I describe in the next poem, when I open the door for the old lady, happened exactly as I tell it here in the village in England that I was living in then, it was about ten years ago. The old lady in question was outside a shop door fumbling with her parcels. When I opened the door for the old lady, she didn't seem to want to pass, and I was ashamed of my long arm stretched against the glass of the door, because I felt the pathos of her thought and loneliness. It's all pretense. He can't really care. How should a young arm stretched and a strong little finger pressed care for my old nose and mange of hair? And in my shame I could not tell her with a smile that even with her parcel and her nose and hair, omne ens est verum, omne ens est unum bonum pulcrum, that in solitude of being she was not sterile, that I had found instead her stubby fumbling mounting to my head, that I had found her intimate and whole, and all the grey gauchery of ageing, rare, beautiful, and real. Well, now I switch that same objective intensity on to the act of love itself. It begins with an assessment from the eyes, leads to a focus of body on body, an illumination along the circumference of sense, to an infusion horizontal and in depth. First, then, they have netted one another's eyes, the peripheries lighted up, the bodies swaying into each other's gravity. Implicit in the eyes, is everything. Now comes the first touch, hand in hand, in a sudden focus, fingers begin to hear and ears to sing, a glowing vulnerability tinctures the flesh, heady with perception as they kiss. Drum beats, and a suffusion of rhythm, the universe accelerates in a roaring of senses, the taut skin runs with flame. The kiss accumulates into a deep embrace. One body droops as the other hardens, natural enfolding to a natural pressure, for truth will be pressed out from the earth's folds. He strews her gently over the ground, as soft as the limbs of infancy, and comes over her like a cloud with the sun behind, Elaborate amplitude and mass of man, covering virgin receptivity. The young sun slants with elegant elan towards the waiting earth. The hill of Venus waits for the cloud and the sun. She lies there in the depths of fecundity. The lips of the white uterus quiver, impatient with instinct to receive or emit the head of a baby. Mute with longing, the O of its hidden mouth dilates to the expected touch, uttering its own irrepressible syllables of invitation to the flaring head that stands uncapped as the long dull rear stripped in its static dance, and then at last is laid, pointing. It stares with a bullet blindness hard into the shadowy cleft. And now, the lunging most beautiful member, beyond patience with passionate gazing, bursts apart the double hood and rages into the dark empyrean, 
swarming into a sensation of diamonds, sensation of silk and dropping fire, as if the skin itself heard music, and a pestle chastised a cavern of perfume. A huge, heavy head, red, exquisite with elemental baldness, gorges into the dark softness, caressed and drawn inch by inch to its banquet. And now the vigorous elegance of man, total body purchased on body, works over the virgin undulations, felling the hills and dales with pressure. The hushed corridor of the female enclave, trussed with a pillar swabbed by fire, cries out like pulsating marble as the fibres of its joy are stretched, broken, crammed and stroked by the flaming Hyperion, till suddenly... The skies burst, an impetus of galaxies explodes the womb with the earth's diapason, warm pearls generate deep. The point of joy collapses after the shower, gun smoking, imperceptibly the sluggard member, senile at the mouth like a feeding baby crawls up to its old nesting place, loitering after so much glory. That great thinker and priest, Tyre de Chardin, says that to love is to discover and complete oneself in someone other than oneself. And he goes on, we must begin to discover in each other not merely the elements of one and the same thing, but a single spirit in search of itself. But is love just a reflection of our own intensity, or is it a real relationship fraught with sacrifice and danger? And how does one merge the self with the other? I attempt to answer this in a little poem called The Paradigm of Love. I call it simple because it uses one of the most elementary devices in poetry to get an effect that of repetition. And we'll see here that the repetition is mainly of one word. So a paradigm or a paradigm of love. Does love live only as a mirror lives and give so much back only as a mirror gives, which gazes only with what gazing gave and gives by gazing back that only? Can love live only as an echo lives in places where a shout has called and give back only as an echo gives, which falling faces only on the back of calling and gives by lack that only. No, love lives more really than a mirror lives, less ghostly than an echo gives back only shadows to a call, more deeply throws all its substance out, can stun but sweetly, less like an echo than a shout, less like a shadow than the sun, not only dangerous, but lonely. Letter to a young girl contemplating marriage with a poet. Let me come clean with you, my girl, it's not what you think. The moon over water and a warm wind, plains of frangipani in a blooming land. I once knew a girl who lived in dread of drawing and of not drawing blood. Better to marry a bank clerk or a garage hand. They, at least when the sun goes down, will come home to you again. Hesperus, says Sappho, brings home everything, the sheep and the goat and the mother's darling, everything the day has scattered far. Only the poet knows no evening star. He is always there, but seldom where you are. The bank clerk and the garage hand, tired, will be yours again. And the summer evening, young as afternoon, do you hear the cars still purring down the road? The poet is still travelling, self-absorbed. 
His many thoughts may be of you, but this is something that you'll never know. Cheated of your love songs by a blue lagoon, I knew a girl once who lived in dread of drawing and of not drawing blood. And another thing, in money he'll be chasing dreams. You'll never be quite sure how rich you are, how poor. You have love enough, you say, for two, but do you think you ever could come to live in dread of drawing and of not drawing blood, do you? Because one day you'll want to hurt being so near a fire, but cold, singing of youth with him, but old, you'll want to drag the passion out of him, or die. But if you do, you'll rake the embers out of him that burst into words on flame which burn in him, and he lives by. Alas, yes, the dangers and pitfalls of love snare most of us in the end, though not to have made the loving not worth while, for all the time we should be growing, and no object of love, in my opinion, will ever compare with the full flood and dimension of love we shall encounter one day. Meanwhile, painful though the decline and death of love may be, these are real aspects of life and therefore worthy of celebration, the very possibility of destruction and demise are essential to our expanding and deepening awareness. There's been a death inside the family, a death but nobody died, and I'm suddenly old. There's been a loss inside the home, but nobody's gone, oh, where did it go? There's been a robbery under our eyes. I wasn't alone, but it's gone. The gold, the thing that glinted inside your breast, is absent, as good as dead or lead or something sold. There's been a decease right in the home. Something slipped by you and me, and nobody told. It's absent, it's over and I am alone and cold. Although the poet doesn't write to please anyone but himself, he uses himself as the exemplar, the guinea pig, if you like, for all, and thus writes for humanity. For me, a poem reaches universality if anyone, anyone within reason, that is, picking it up and reading it, says, that is, about me, or it may not be about me, but I could see how it could be about me. But now, for a deeper love, a higher synthesis of the spirit, we are all rocketing towards the infinite with fragments of each other, and the ultimate point of evolution is the divine consciousness, which already wraps the universe around in a tightening cone of awareness towards which everything converges. Christ of the Apocalypse. I have a plundering heart and a roar and thirsting tongue and my arms and eyes rampage for they are young and they go flailing round the world hungering to embrace and move stars, atoms, jungles, towns, saints, psychologists and clowns. So let my yearning groan and thunder come, and all my silence go where it has gone, for I must whip the essence out of being and drum my flaming angels on and thresh the planets to a state of love where everything is strong and burst and drive the infinite through infinitesimal into my own, my father's song. more, another one on the same sort of theme. And by the way, um, uh, I always say this, that a poet doesn't demand that you believe him. No, he simply asks that you share in the feelings that stem from his belief. The Risen Christ, this poem is still about love, but 
It's about the desperate need of the Christian, or shall we just say the human being, to integrate his life, his concern, his compassion with everything that is happening. The words here, as so often in poetry, are a paradox. They seem to be against peace, but they are really against war. They seem to be against religion, but they are really against complacency. And finally, they are not against anger, but against hate. The Risen Christ The litany of daily murders entering my ears turns into doves that bill and coo. In what alcoves of my brain do these ring doves nest and rear such gawking faith, such hope that gapes? In what place? I am the one that centers the Christian soul on turning the other cheek and peace, castrator of hearts, surgeon of the tame. I am the vine, the branches you. We grow no grapes of wrath, no grapes at all. Under sedation, my anger is sedate, my outbursts few. Give me back my pain. Yes, I am the Christ of peace, the smiler who accommodates. My religion is as suave as rain. A metaphysics commensurate with space focuses the very neutrons of my gaze on the passionate sheen of a fly's wing. But where, where is my fluorescent rage on a million babies dying? Where is that which charged up through my throat like a flower and broke, or still could break, like fire or lava in a rank cascade, or that unstaunchable trickle of sorrow that makes my mouth luminously sweet to the lover who grieves. When was I last crucified between two thieves? Forget then, oh, forget my risen peace, and give me back my pain. Give me back my place. Did you see my hideous beauty before I died? Did you see my face? Then catch me in my old demise. Catch my disease and catch my rage. <laughs>